So I'm really delighted to see all of you. Today we have an exciting topic. We are going to go to the South Pole. It's chasing ghosts, searching for neutrinos from astrophysical sources. And I'm really delighted to introduce from you from the Antarctic. No, I'm only joking, not from the Antarctic, but it's Jessie Twaits. And she's a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Jessica, welcome. Welcome to iTelescope. We are delighted to have you here today. Hi. Yeah, I'm excited to be giving a webinar today. Yeah, we're very excited. This is such an unusual topic, and I've just talked about M101, and it's just what a coincidence that this all happens today. You planned this so well. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, Jesse, I'll give the floor to you. Um, it's all yours. You just tell me when you want to launch polls and so on. Okay. And go ahead. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so I think I'll start just sharing my slides. Um, make sure that that all is yes, going. Yes, see it. Beautiful. Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, what an image. I'm sorry. This is fantastic. Okay, so now I'm going to be quiet. It's fantastic. <laughs> no. Okay, um, go ahead. Yeah, so hi, everyone. Um, I am a PhD student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, and I work on the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory, um, which is a neutrino detector deep in the um, Antarctic ice at the South Pole. Um, so this is one picture that was taken by um, one of our winter overs. So this is the Ice Cube Lab at the South Pole, and you can see the beautiful galaxy and the aurora as well there. Um, so I have two polls that we were going to run, and I think we can run them um, now. So the first okay. one um, I'm going to ask is, how many astrophysical neutrinos do you think Ice Cube sees every year? Um, and so I'm, I will have some options for you. Um, so option A is 100, option B is 10, option C is 100,000, and option D is 1 million. So what do you think? How many astrophysical neutrinos does Ice Cube see every year? Jesse, can you repeat that just for everyone? So A was? 10? A is 100. 100, sorry, A is 100, yes. B is 10. Yes. Um, C is 100,000, and D is a million. OK, got that, got that. Yes, that's a difficult one. That's quite difficult. <laughs> That's a good, good, good one. I have really also no idea what the answer would be, but let's see, let's see what that would, what, what we uh, get there. I'm just going to give them a few more seconds. Yeah. Okay, let me end the poll, and you'll probably, and uh, now you should be able to see it. You, maybe you can comment on this. <laughs> okay. Um... Yeah, it looks like we have a broad range of answers, which is good. Um, and I think I think I'm actually going to leave it a little bit longer. Um, I think I'll tell you about it a little bit in the talk. Um, so the answer actually is that we see about 10 astrophysical neutrinos a year. So actually B, which it looks like a lot of people got right. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about what we see in our detector as well um, in this talk. Okay, um, so then I have a second question for everyone. So I'm also going to talk a lot about multi-messenger astrophysics in this talk. And I'm curious it, how, I'm curious what people think. Um, if you don't know what that is, if you don't know what multi-messenger astrophysics is, that's totally fine. I'm going to talk about it. Um, that's why we're here. But I'm curious how, what people think or how many astrophysical messengers are there? How many am I going to talk about today? And so the options for this one are A is three, B is four, C is five, and D is two. Oh, wow. And... <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. Again, three, four, five, two. Did I get that right? Yep. Yep. Three, four, five, two. Okay. Got it. Yes. Okay, this is going to be really this is complete guesswork. <laughs> that's totally fair. That's that's why we're that's why we're here. That's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, 
Don't be afraid. So three, A is three, B is four, C is five, and B is two, just to remind you. And just try, it doesn't matter really, just, um, okay, I will share this now. And this is exactly what I would have expected. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so it looks pretty even um, across, across all of the answers. So that one, I'm not going to give you the answer to yet, but I'll tell you about it as we go through the talk. Thank you. Um, okay. So that was kind of to give me a little bit of background on where people are at with, with this. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with this talk then. So let's see, there we go. All right, so I'm going to start with something that's maybe a little bit more familiar to a lot of people here, which is looking at the universe in different wavelengths of light. So here I have an image that is in the optical. This is from Gaia. And you can see the plane of the galaxy pretty clearly. And then you can see some dust and you can see the large and small Magellanic clouds as well. So we can get a lot of, a lot of information from this image. But what about if we shift to a different wavelength of light? So if instead of looking at optical, we were to look in radio, what we're seeing looks very different. We see a lot of similar things. So you can still see the galaxy across the center of the plot. Um, but now you see some different features than you, that you didn't see in the optical and some in the optical that you don't see in the radio. And again, if we look in the microwave or the infrared, this is from um, an instrument called WMAP, then we can see the same, we can see the galaxy, but then we see different features than in either of the other two wavelengths. And if we go to the highest energy photons that we can look at our universe in, so these are the gamma rays, we can still see the galaxy, but now we see all of these other little points, which are actually extragalactic, so outside of our galaxy. And so looking at the universe in all of these different wavelengths, we get very different information about what we're seeing. And each of these wavelengths tells us something new about, in this example, about the galaxy, about what we're looking at. But what if we can look at the universe in not just different wavelengths, but also different messengers, so different particles that can give us some information about the universe that we're seeing. And then that would be different information to the light that we typically look at the universe in. So that's what I'm going to focus on today. This is called multi-messenger astronomy. So the first, the first messenger I'm going to start with um, was discovered when a man named Victor Hess ascended on a balloon into the atmosphere to measure the amount of ionizing radiation as he went up. And this was in 1912. And he found that actually it increases as you go towards space. So the increasing radiation meant that it was coming from outer space. And so this is one of those cosmic messengers that I've been talking about. This is cosmic rays. So what actually are cosmic rays? Cosmic rays are charged particles that are being accelerated in different cosmic sources out in the universe. And they can have huge energies, so all the way up to 10 to the 21st electron volts, or we've observed them all the way up to that energy. So to kind of put that into context, what does, what does that energy actually mean? If we took something like the Large Hadron Collider, which this is a picture of a Large Hadron Collider, which is um, in the earth, uh, deep <laughs> underground at CERN, if we took something like that, an accelerator like that, we would need one with the same radius of Mercury's orbit to accelerate particles all the way up to those energies that I'm talking about for cosmic rays. So these are high energy charged particles that are being accelerated out in the universe, and then we can observe them on Earth. So I've talked a little bit about two different messengers already. So that's light was the first, and then now cosmic rays. But how does that connect to neutrinos? So bringing that back together, there's our light, there's photons um, in the standard model of elementary particles. So this is, this is taking a brief foray into, into particle physics here. And then we have our quarks, which make up protons and neutrons and some other particles. So that would be what's making up cosmic rays, making up charged particles, um, and some neutral ones as well. 
And then we have what are called leptons. So that would be like your electron. And then there's two heavier versions. So a muon is a little, it's, you can think of it as a heavier electron and a tau, which is even heavier than that. And then we also have the neutrinos. So these are not charged, but they're also kind of like an electron um, in the way that they act. So what actually are they? They are chargeless, massless particles. And they were proposed in 1930 to conserve energy in the decay of a neutron. So what people saw was a neutron was decaying into a proton and an electron. But some of the energy went missing in that decay, and people weren't really sure where that was going. Um, so this person, Wolfgang Pauli, proposed that there was a third particle that we couldn't see, uh, which he called a neutrino. It was taking away some of the energy um, in that decay of the neutron. And we now know that that is what was happening. And these also occur in cosmic ray sources. So some of these really high energy sources out in the universe that are producing these high energy charged particles, these cosmic rays, are also producing neutrinos. And the way that this happens is when we have these cosmic rays, they're accelerated to these very high energies, and then they can interact with things around them. So they can interact with other cosmic rays or um, background photons, or even sometimes with a nucleus, like what was happening in our atmosphere. And then when that happens, they can produce pions, which decay, and we get um, here, what's being shown here is a positron and some neutrinos. And so I've kind of given a little bit about three messengers that we can look at the universe in. So photons, which are really helpful uh, to looking directly out in the universe. They, sh they show you exactly where they've come from. Um, and we can look at the we can look at the universe in multiple wavelengths to get a lot of information through photons. But there's some other messengers as well. So I talked a little bit about cosmic rays, which are charged particles. So here it's being shown in this blue line. And the reason it's kind of winding like this is that because it's a charged particle, it can be deflected by magnetic fields on its way to us. So they don't point back to their source as well. Um, because they kind of have to follow the magnetic field lines of stars in their path or galaxies um, along their way to us. And then I've also talked a little bit about neutrinos, which point directly back to their source because they don't interact very often. Um, but they are a little, they are harder to detect because they don't interact often. So it's good that we can look at them and point directly back to their source, but they can also be difficult to use because they don't interact very often. I've neglected to mention one messenger that I will also talk about in this talk, and that's gravitational waves. So this is the fourth messenger that, I'm ta that I'll talk about, and gravitational waves are ripples in space-time that are predicted by general relativity. And there's a couple different types, but in this talk, I'm going to focus on the ones that come from very heavy, compact objects. Um, so when I say a compact object, I mean something that is very, very massive in a very, very small area. And it's when those two objects orbit around each other and eventually merge. That's the kind of gravitational waves I'm gonna be talking about. Um, and so we've observed these. Um, so when two black holes or two neutron stars or a neutron star and a black hole merge, then we can get these signatures that are very characteristic in gravitational waves. And so in this animation, you can see two neutron stars orbiting each other and then the waves that they're producing, the gravitational waves that they're producing as they do that. And so what we've seen this with thus far is ground-based gravitational wave detectors. So these are several different detectors, which are basically two very, very long laser arms which interfere with each, which the laser light interferes with each other. And then we get this very characteristic signal when we have these objects merge out in space. Um, so here I'm showing a picture of one of the LIGO detectors. This is the one in Louisiana. Um, but there's also multiple gravitational wave detectors, which I'll talk about um, in this talk. And so those are being shown um, on the plot or the, the map in the bottom there. And so like I've been talking about, as you have these two objects, so here that's again two neutron stars, they are orbiting around each other and they have this gravitational wave, but then as they get closer together, 
the frequency of that goes up and the amplitude goes up and then eventually they merge and you get this very um very close together waves and very high um frequency signal that we look for with these detectors so I've now talked about some of the messengers that we consider in multi-messenger astronomy. So it's back to the poll that I asked at the beginning, um, how many messengers are there? I'm gonna talk about four. Um, some people would add a fifth, which is dark matter, but the four that I'm gonna talk about today are photons, cosmic rays, neutrinos, and gravitational waves. And so by looking in the universe in all four of these messengers or in combinations of these messengers, we can get more information about sources out in the universe. So I'm gonna stop here for a minute and ask if there's any questions thus far. I'm happy to take a short break if there are. Yeah, come jump in, please. So nobody's put anything in the Q&A, but let's just give it a minute, uh, Jesse, okay. and just wait. <clears throat> I think everyone's stunned. <laughs> <laughs> They're very stunned. Uh, yeah, by the way, put your questions, please, in the Q&A section. Don't uh, hesitate, because usually we have so many questions. Let me just see. Is there an open question? Yes, there is one. Sorry, I missed that one here. Ari says, are neutrinos the most fundamental particles? That's the question. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so they are a fundamental particle. Um, in, in the standard model of particle physics, they are a fundamental particle. They're not made up of other particles. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. That's a good question. OK, thank you. And then we'll go to Ian. Um, Ian says, how do the magnetic fields affect these messengers? Hmm. Yeah, that's also a good question. Um, so when you have a charged particle, that particle will follow a magnetic field line, or they'll, they'll be deflected by different magnetic fields. So for cosmic rays, there is a significant impact. So the cosmic rays will be deflected by magnetic fields and kind of take those wandering paths to us. Whereas photons and neutrinos are not charged. So they're not deflected by magnetic fields in the same way. So that's why they point back to their sources very well. Okay, and I'll take one more question and then we'll 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 continue. Otherwise, we <laughs> this yeah, perfect. Is, here's Otto. By the way, Otto gave a very nice picture of M one hundred one, which I'll show you later. Um, yeah. Is the detector for gravitational waves some sort of Michelson interferometer? And the answer is yes, of course it is. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> it, is, it is. Yes. Yes. Also a good question. And yes, 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 it is. Okay, so best is maybe if you carry on, then we'll go with the yeah. other questions later. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about the messengers now. So how do we actually detect neutrinos? Because I said that they're neutral and they're massless. So how do we actually see them? So when these were postulated, um, Pauli said, I've done a terrible thing. I've postulated a particle that cannot be detected. So he thought that we actually couldn't see neutrinos and he had just made up this particle that we'd never be able to detect. And in actuality, we can detect them. We just need a large enough detector. So they don't interact very often. Um, they interact weakly and pretty rarely, but with a large enough area, we can see them. And so that's where IceCube comes in. So the IceCube Neutrino Observatory is a cubic kilometer detector in the ice at South Pole. So here I have an image of what IceCube looks like in the ice. So you can see on the top, the IceCube lab is marked. So that's the picture that I was showing at the very beginning of this presentation. And then you can see all of these strings that are embedded in the ice. And on each of them, um, these little darker circles, which you see kind of start about halfway down, um, are our modules, which are looking in the ice for signatures. And so the size of this detector is about a cubic kilometer. And that size allows us to look for neutrinos that are in the TeV energies, um, TeV to PeV. So 
that is 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 15 electron volts, so high energy neutrinos. There's also a denser part in the center that's highlighted in green, which is called deep core, and that targets lower energy neutrinos. So that's GeV to TeV. So that's 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 12 electron volts. And we can use other techniques um, by looking at the hit rate that we see in our detector and seeing if we see an increase that would be consistent with a supernova or something like that, we can, look, we can use those techniques to look for MeV neutrinos as well. Um, so we have sensitivity over a wide range of energies in IceCube. And what the actual detectors look like is we have these 86 strings with almost 5,200 digital optical modules. And so this is a picture of one of them. Um, this one's actually been opened up, so they usually are fully enclosed sphere. And so you can see the electronics on top here, and this shiny part on the bottom is a photomultiplier tube. And so that is actually what's picking up the signals in the ice that we're looking for to see neutrinos. So what are we actually seeing in the ice? I said that neutrinos are neutral, so what are we picking up? So neutrinos travel at the speed of light. And when they interact in the ice, they produce a charged particle. So it could be an electron, it could be a muon, um, and that is also traveling relativistically. And actually, it's traveling faster than the speed of light in ice. So in a medium, we can have a speed of light that's a little bit slower than the absolute speed of light that we would see out in vacuum. Um, but we can have particles that still travel faster than that speed in the ice in the medium. And the effect that happens is basically like a sonic boom. Um, so you get this cone of light that comes off um, as, the, as that particle is traveling through the ice. And it's that light that's coming out in a cone that we actually see in these modules. Um, so here I have a picture of the plane. You can see of a plane basically doing a, having a sonic boom. Um, and you can see this... Um, cone of vapor, and it would actually be of sound as well. And we get the same thing, but with, with light. Um, and so this is called Cherenkov light. That's the name of this effect. And so what that actually looks like in our detector can have a couple of different forms based on the type of neutrino. So there's actually three different types. We call those flavors in particle physics. Um, so those are electron, muon, and tau. And also depending on how it interacts, what, it, what it's um, interacting with. Um, so usually they interact with a nucleus in the ice. And then we can get these different signatures in our detector. So on the, I'll start with the one on the left. So this is a track-like event. So the reason we call it a track is that it looks like there's been a single particle that's gone straight through the detector. The color is the timing information. So the Darker, the darker colors, so the green here, um, green or blue, would be earlier, and then the red is late. Um, and so as the particle travels through the detector, we see that clear track so we can point back where it came from. The second type that we see pretty often is what we call a cascade. So it looks more like a sphere, it's a little harder to tell where it's coming from, um, and this can come from either an electron neutrino interacting on our detector, or um, sometimes neutrinos have scattering interactions in the detector and they deposit some energy and it would look like this. And then the final type um, is also what is also the rarest type, which is called a double bang. So you actually see the double cascade here. And so what's happening is this is a tau neutrino that interacts in the detector and then becomes a muon, and then that muon travels a little bit, and then also, um, sorry, the tau travels a little bit, and then decays into a muon, um, and so we get the second cascade. Um, so these are the three types of signatures that we see in our detector at, in IceCube. So the challenging part of this, um, so I've already talked about a little bit of the challenge is that, that neutrinos interact very rarely, but there's also a lot of backgrounds in neutrino astronomy. So I've heard it compared to doing astronomy during the day, so with all the lights on. Um, most of this background is from cosmic rays interacting in our atmosphere. And so this is going to go back to the first question that I asked, which was how many astrophysical neutrinos does IceCube see every year? Well, 
Ice Cube sees about 100 billion atmospheric muons. So these are from cosmic rays interacting in our detector, which then those muons pass through our detector and they produce tracks, just like the one that I just showed you. We see about 100,000 atmospheric neutrinos. So those are also from those interactions in the atmosphere. And we see about 10 astrophysical neutrinos a year. So the background is very high when we're talking about um, the neutrinos in our detector. So one of the ways that we um, that we combat this is that a lot of those um, backgrounds are at lower energies. So by looking at higher energies, we can see neutrinos that are more likely to have come from some astrophysical source. And so in 2012, IceCube detected two neutrinos that we were very sure are extra, extraterrestrial neutrinos with energies that were very high on the order of 10 to the 15 electron volts. So that is a PEV. And these two neutrinos are called Bert and Ernie. Um, and so here is what they look like in our, in our detector. Um, you'll notice that they both kind of look like those um, cascade events that I showed in our detector. Each of the dots is one of those modules that's in the ice. So another way that we can cut down on our background and look for sources of neutrinos is to use the power of multi-messenger astronomy. And so essentially what we do is we look for neutrinos that are coming from sources seen in other messengers. So we look at neutrinos coming from other galaxies that have been seen in photons or from maybe a cosmic ray source that we think is there or from a gravitational wave source. And so this happened um, earlier, or sorry, at the end of last year, Ice Cube looked in the direction of 110 known photon emitters using the full amount of ice cube data. So we have 10 years of ice cube data and we scanned the entire Northern sky. So that's what's being shown in this picture. And you can see that there are three sources highlighted here. And the one I'm gonna draw your attention to is one called NGC 1068. And we found evidence for neutrinos that were coming from this galaxy, NGC 1068. And so you can see, um, I'm gonna start with, this plot on the right, so you can see the signal versus background. So you can see that there's that little bump in signal really close to where the source would be. Um, and so you can see that that pops out among all of the backgrounds that we're seeing. And by using statistical techniques, we can um, look for, we can look in that direction and see that signal using the statistical techniques. And so we looked in this, the direction of NGC 1068 and saw an excess in neutrinos coming from that source. So what actually is NGC 1068? This is a type of active galactic, active, active galactic nucleus, sorry, um, or AGN. So this is a supermassive black hole that is actively accreting material, so eating material from around it and spitting it back out. Um, and so this is one particular type, which is called a Seifert II galaxy. So I'll take another short pause here. This is my second pause, and then, um, then I will have the last section. OK, thank you. Let me just uh, have a quick look, Jesse. Here we go. So Bert is asking, how do energy levels of gravitational waves compare to gamma rays and cosmic rays? <laughs> Ooh, that's a really good question that I'm not sure I know the answer to. Yeah, I think the the question of energy levels can be a bit misleading because, I mean, of course, the detection of gravitational waves relates to really small energies. But if you put it on a large scale, you could say there's a huge energies, right? So maybe one would have to talk about energy density here. Um, uh, yeah. Know. So, yeah, that would that would definitely make sense, but I'm not sure I know those energy densities off the top of my head that's either. That's fine. That's fine. That's that's good. Okay, next question: Neutrinos are not made of quarks? Question mark from George. <laughs> they are not. Um, that is that's a good question as well. So um, neutrinos are their own. They're a fundamental particle. They're actually a lepton, um, and so quarks make up. What we, what we would call hadrons. So these are something like 
a proton or a neutron or a pion. Um, so neutrinos are actually a fundamental particle by themselves. Yes, good. Okay, Ari, um, actually my question was, oh, he has another question. Are neutrinos the most fundamental particles? That's what he's saying, the most fundamental. That's That was his question. I'm not sure what you mean by most. Well, I guess he was talking about quarks and so on, you know. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Um, so I think... Um, I think I'm, I'm not totally sure what you mean by most okay, I, fundamental, I think, I think but, I um, I think okay. I understand this question because you just said that neutrinos are not made of quarks. So the, the right. counter question is, well, then is it a most fundamental uh, particle, which is made of up of nothing else, but only the uh, that's what he's getting at. Yes. 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 And that I would definitely say yes to, mm -hmm. um, so when we're talking about a fundamental particle, we usually talk about something that's not made up of anything else. Um, so it's it's basically the like you can't look at it and be made up of other things um, in the same way that you can look at, say, a proton and say that it's made up of multiple quarks. Yeah. Right. Good. Okay. Thank you. We'll take one more from John, and then we'll carry on. Yep. Again. So they're they're flowing in now. I'm not surprised, John. Are gamma rays in the cosmic rays family? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so they are separate. They are separate um, messengers. I think the fact that they're named cosmic rays might be a little bit misleading because it sounds the same as gamma ray. Um, but a gamma ray is a photon. Um, and so it, from a particle physics perspective, we would consider that um, a boson. So it's a separate type of um, particle when we're talking about photons than, say, a cosmic ray, whereas a cosmic ray is a charged particle. Um, so something like a proton or um, a neutron as well, or some, some, but mostly, most of the time we consider protons or um sometimes different atomic nuclei are also considered um cosmic rays but they are separate actually thank you jesse okay okay all right so now i'm going to get in this section a little bit more into the research that i do which is looking at transient astronomy so what am i talking about when i say something that's a transient that's anything that would go bump in the galaxy. So a flare, a supernova, a nova, a gamma ray burst, these are a few examples of something that's a transient. So this is some event that happens that we see um, in, for the example of supernova, like when we just had in one, M101, then we would see um, it's been seen in photons and it's over some time scale. And so, in neutrino astronomy, we can look at transients and we can look in short time windows around when they're going off, when they're happening, and that allows us to cut down on our background a lot. So it's really helpful for us to look in these short time windows around when transients are happening. And many of them are also very high energy. So we think that we would see neutrinos from them as well. And if we do this really quickly, as things are happening, that's called real-time astronomy astronomy. So reacting to things in real time as they're happening and sending those in, that information out to the community. And so this happened in 2017. IceCube sent out a high energy neutrino to the astrophysical community. Um, and so this is a, a picture of that neutrino. So here again, the color is the timing information. And then you can see this arrow that's tracing back where the neutrino came from. And so we saw this high energy neutrino and we sent it out to the community um, via a notice that gets sent to different astronomers at different telescopes. And it was followed up by a huge network, network of telescopes in real time. So it was followed up by SWIFT, by the Fermi satellites, by Agile, by MAGIC. So followed up by all of these telescopes, many of which are looking at very different wavelengths of light. And a blazar which its name is TXS 0506 plus 056, was found to be flaring in gamma rays at the same time and in the same direction. 
So we actually found a multi-messenger source that gave us this high energy neutrino and was also found to be flaring in gamma rays. So what a blazar is, is another one of those active galactic nuclei, so a supermassive black hole that's actively accreting material from around it and spitting it back out to us. Um, and it's spitting it out in these jets. So that's what's being shown in this picture. You can see this jet, and that jet happens to be pointed towards us. Um, and so that's what we're seeing from TXS. So these real-time searches can be really exciting, and we can look for neutrinos from their astrophysical sources in real time. So I'm going to talk about two that I've been involved with for two different types of sources. So the first one is an extremely bright gamma ray burst, the brightest gamma ray burst ever seen, GRB 221009A, um, which here is showing a GIF of that gamma ray burst going off and then fading. And then the second is a search for neutrinos from gravitational wave sources. So I'm going to talk about that one in a minute, but I'm going to start by talking about this extremely bright and exceptional gamma ray burst. So starting off, what are GRBs? Gamma ray bursts come in two different types, and the two different types tell you what type of source it's coming from. Um, so there's a type that's short bursts, so those are bursts with a duration less than two seconds, and then long bursts, which have a duration longer than two seconds. And the short ones um, tend to come from, we think, um, neutron star mergers. So mergers of two neutron stars, um, which then gives us this short burst in gamma rays. And then the long type, which this GRB is a long gamma ray burst, are from the deaths of extremely massive stars. Um, so this was a uh, long GRB. It had a duration of um, about 325 seconds. So um, it was definitely a long GRB. This is a very exceptional burst. It was first seen by the Gamma Ray Burst Monitor on the Fermi satellite on the 9th of October, 2022. And they sent out a notice in real time to many different telescopes. It was seen at a redshift of 0.151, which is about 740 megaparsecs. And it's near the plane of our galaxy. So that's what you can see in this, um, in this animation. You see the burst, you see the big flare, but then that line that's going across the animation is actually the plane of our galaxy. So you see it briefly outshine the plane of our galaxy and then kind of fade away. IceCube also followed up this burst, and we sent our results to the community only 27 hours after the burst occurred. And we also, from this burst, saw the highest, ever, highest energy photon ever seen from a GRB which was sent by the LASSO collaboration. So before this burst, we'd only seen photons up to one TeV. And in, for this burst, the LASSO collaboration saw photons all the way up to 10 TeV. So very high energy photons from this burst, and it was very, very bright. Um, oh, that's a little out of order, but SWIFT also saw this. It came into view of this burst about an hour later, um, and they also sent their notice in real time as well. So it has been referred to as the boat or the brightest of all time. It was so bright that it actually saturated both instruments on the Fermi satellite. When there are too many photons, that the instrument can't quite keep up. Um, and so they got a huge burst of photons um, in these two shaded regions. So you can see what they observed in the dotted here. It's a little bit hard to see, but it's, um, it's lower and it's dotted. And then they had to go back and reconstruct how many photons actually were in their detector because of some of these pileup effects that you get when, um, when there's too many photons trying to interact at the same time. And they saw at some points in the burst, six million photons per second trying to interact in their detector. So extremely bright. So this is from the gamma ray burst monitor, GBM. And it's also extremely exceptional when compared to a broad range of other GRBs. So this plot is showing the fluence. So fluence is the flux integrated over both time and energy. So it's telling us over the course of this GRB, how much energy did we get deposited over the time that we looked at it. And so you can see all of these historic GRBs in the dotted points. And then you can see the two measurements of this GRB in the stars. And as you go to the right on the, on the, on the x-axis, you go brighter. 
So you can see that this is extremely bright in comparison to other GRBs. So fluence is a measure of what we're seeing at Earth, but what about at the source as this GRB was happening? Well, for that, we can look at the energy that it sent out, the, the energy that it um, emitted as it went off. And so that's what's being shown in the y-axis, and it's, the x-axis is redshift. So you can think about it as distance. Um, and so you can see that this is also the highest energy, or the, the most energy put out by a GRB um, as well. So that's what's being shown in the star compared to previous record holders like GRB 090323A, which is the, the green square. So this GRB is truly very exceptional. It is very, very bright, both at its source and at Earth. Um, so what about Ice Cube? What did we see in neutrinos? So we looked in high energy neutrinos. So that's in the TeV to PeV range with two time windows. The first one was an hour before the burst to two hours after. And we chose that to um, cover both the GBM um, trigger, the gamma ray burst monitor, and also the SWIFT um, to try to catch the full duration of the burst. And then also plus or minus one day around when the burst went off. And we actually found no significant emission in either of those time windows. So within Ice Cube, we decided to follow up with analyses over a huge range of energy. So MEV to PEV neutrinos, that's nine orders of magnitude in, ener in neutrino energy, and a huge range of time windows. So ranging from the duration of the burst, 325 seconds, to all the way up to 15 days around the burst. And we didn't see any significant neutrino emission in any of those time windows. And so for all of those, we set what's called an upper limit. So essentially what we're saying is if it was at this level or above, we would have seen it. Um, and those upper limits give us a lot of information about what was actually happening at the, GR at the, at the GRB as it was going off. Um, so here on this plot, I'm showing some of those upper limits. So the light blue is the highest energy neutrinos um, that we looked at. So that's the TeV to PeV. And then a little bit lower energy in the green, that's in the GeV range, and then even lower energy in the um, magenta red. And then comparing that to the two instruments on the Fermi satellite. So that is the two dotted lines that are shown on this plot. And generally, we would expect those to be about at the same level. So we can set very constraining upper limits, which means it tells us a lot about what we're looking at in this particular GRB by looking at those photon measurements versus the neutrinos. Um, and it's also important to note that actually the, the two lines, the, the top line for GBM, so this flat line and the yellow Fermi lat line are actually underestimates. So that's before the correction that I talked about before. Um, so this was even brighter in photons than, than is being shown on this plot here. So even though we didn't see anything, this gives us a lot of information about GRBs and is very exciting for Ice Cube. So now I'm going to change gears a little bit and talk about searches for neutrinos from gravitational wave sources. So a different type of source, but also looking for neutrinos from these compact object mergers in real time. And so we are looking at um, information from the ground-based gravitational wave detectors. So I'm showing this same picture again. Um, and we are, we, we are currently in the newest operating run of these gravitational wave detectors. So that actually started on Wednesday of this week. Um, the previous operating run ended in March of 2020. And then there was a long um, gap when they did a lot of improvements to the detectors. They made some really significant changes that helped improve how far out these detectors can see in the universe. And so that's what's being shown here. Um, so you can see the different operating runs. So they've had a few different ones and different observatories have joined as time has gone on. So the two LIGO observatories are both in the US. Um, those are on the top. And then Virgo in Italy. And then Kagra, which is joining um, from Japan for this new newest operating run four. Um, so that's being shown in the purple. And then the previous run is shown in green, that's 03. And you can see that they can see much further out in 04 because of all of these improvements that were done um, to the gravitational wave detectors. So 
Um, this is the sensitivity that the gravitational wave detectors would have to two neutron stars merging, um, which is really exciting for follow-up because for those two neutron stars merging, we expect to see a short GRB, which is what happened in the case of um, GW170817, if you're familiar with that one, um, and the short gamma ray burst that we saw from that. So what about neutrinos? As the objects merge, we could see a jet, which could accelerate particles, and then we could see neutrinos from that. And the reason we want to do this in real time is that it's easier to localize a neutrino than it is a gravitational wave event. So this is one example um, of a gravitational wave event that happened in operating run three. So this happened in September, in September of 2019. And you can see the gravitational wave localization is in the red and yellow um, colors. And then the circles are neutrinos. So the neutrinos are very well localized and we can help identify um, the, if we see a neutrino coincident with the gravitational wave map, then we can help inform other follow-ups and tell telescopes where to point their telescopes because otherwise there's these very large regions of the sky um, that the gravitational wave merger could have come from. And so far, we've already seen four follow-ups that have been sent out for 04. Um, so the first event was really exciting. It was actually a few days before 04 started. So this was what was sent out by LIGO for the Pagra, and it was a candidate for a neutron star black hole merger. So this was a very exciting event um, sent out in real time. And we followed it up. We did not see anything from this um, particular event, but this is the notice that we send out in real time. And we're very excited to see how 04 progresses. So there already have been four events. Um, this is just the first one of those four. So in conclusion, um, neutrinos give us a new window into the high energy universe. And they give us a lot of exciting hints about neutrino sources. And we expect more neutrino sources to be identified as time goes on. Um, I'm also very excited for the rest of the 04 run. So thank you all for your attention. And yeah, I'm happy to take questions.